Hello everyone, welcome to Sarat Chandra S Academy. So today uh, we are starting a new series that is our daily current affairs. So today's video will have the current affairs of 2nd January. So the topics are Supreme Court upholds demonetization. It was in news yesterday. So the decision of the government in 2016 it was upholded by the or upheld by the Supreme Court. So we have to discuss all those relevant information regarding this particular issue in particular to demonetization we will also cover the relevant provisions of rbi act of 1934 and all those forward and backward linkages related to this particular topic second topic will be india to launch its first human space flight program gaganyaan gaganyaan was in news since some years now because of pandemic it was delayed now yesterday the government said it will be launched in 20 24. Another initiative is a smart initiative to boost Ayurveda. Now, here the topic is Ayurveda. So, we have to cover all those historical information. So, we have to do it from history basis, that is ancient history. And all those forward and backward linkages related to Ayurveda. Now, the first uh, External affairs ministers level meet happened between India and Austria in the last 27 years. Now, this kind of current affairs who do not have enough information regarding the meet. But what you can do here is we can cover the border countries of Austria so that it will help us in our map based prelims questions. In our map based prelims question. Next is G20 Digital Innovation Alliance. Recently, G20 is news because India is uh, doing the presidentship of G20 now. So, this particular alliance was in news. We will cover this alliance. Similarly, Stay Safe Online campaign is another kind of a uh, recent uh, campaign. So, we will cover this. And also, the final part is the birth anniversary of Mannatu Padbanava Pillai. So, here we have to cover this with respect to our modern history with respect to our modern history and the topic is dravidian moment so all these things we have to cover and all those extra uh, satyagra for example he also participated in vaikam satyagra he also participated in guru vayur temple satyagra so all those things will be covered in this particular session fine now coming to the first part, RBI, so here Supreme Court upholds demonetization. So I will be explaining the relevant information from both prelims and mains perspective. First of all you need to know, the Supreme Court said that there is no flaw in the center's decision in making, decision making process regarding this particular demonetization. Now you should come, you should know ki from where the government gets its power from where the government gets its power of demonetization. So, the power lies in section 26 of RBI Act. RBI Act of 1934. Now, before coming to the uh, Supreme Court verdict, we should know what is mentioned in the Act. This is what is mentioned in the Act. It says, this section says, on recommendation of the central board, central board, uh, there is already a video on the central board of RBI. It has 21 members and all those information regarding central board we have already covered. So, on recommendation of the central board, the central government may, by notification in the Gazette of India, declare that with effect from such date as may be specified in the notification, any series of bank notes of any denomination shall cease to be a legal tender. It means it is giving the power to the central government. The central government can demonetize any series of bank notes. Now here the Supreme Court said any means all. So there should not be any doubt. Any series means all. It can demonetize of any denomination. So this is the law. But here if you see carefully, here it is clearly mentioned on the recommendation of the Supreme Court. Uh, sorry, on the recommendation of the Central Board of RBI. This is what 
the contention was raised by the petitioners because they lost it. They were saying, the petitioners were saying, section 26 clause 2 was breached because the proposal has emanated from the emanated from the central government. This proposal of demonetization it started from the central government. That's what they are saying. The petitioners were saying. Whereas the requirement is that the proposal should emanate from the central board. They are saying the proposal should come from central board, not from the central government. So this is one point where you can write in the critical analysis. If you are writing the critical analysis, you can write this point and you can write and this is a very much a legal point also. You have to mention this act and you have to write it should come from the recommendation of the central board but it came or it was proposed or it was initiated from the central government. That is what they are saying. So this is one point you get a critical analysis but that is not enough because in the positive part, so you have to write the RBI verdict. In the positive part, in the positive part, you have to write the RBI verdict because you have to support the government because after all, Supreme Court has said ki that a decision was good, it is valid. How? The majority judgment, this is the majority judgment. It said that the two requirements of this section of RBI Act is recommendation and decision. Recommendation of central board and the decision the final decision will be on the central government so this is one point you can write in the positives now there is another dimension to this also now what is the dimension the dimension is the seventh schedule if you see carefully the seventh schedule entry 36 list one of the seventh schedule now, Attorney General, who was representing the government, he pointed out this point. He said, the central government has power to demonetize and it is a constitutional authority as per the 7th schedule, list 1, entry 36. This is what. Now, I'll read it out. This is on the strength of entry 36 of list 1 of 7th schedule of the constitution. The central government is not just concerned with the financial health of the economy, but it is also concerned with the sovereignty and integrity of India, the security of the state, the defense of the country, its friendly relations with foreign countries, internal and external security and various other aspects of governance. On the other hand, the RBI or the bank is only con concerned with regulation of currency notes, monetary policy, price stability and allied matters. So here if you see carefully, this schedule is giving a difference. RBI is only concerned about monetary policy, only about the financial health. But the government is concerned with the financial health and also with the sovereignty and integrity, the security of the state, the defense of the country. Now the government says, if we need to eradicate black money, fake currency, terror funding, etc, etc, it is necessary to demonetize the currency notes in circulation because black money, fake currency, terror funding are nothing but it affects the security of the state, the defense of the state, the integrity of the state. So the government can take action. So this point makes the government decision valid back in 2016. The demonetization situation was decision was valid. Now, here also you can say that the government has also a constitutional authority. Constitutional authority. So, one is legal authority, RBI section, uh, part 2 of section 26 of RBI Act of 1934. One is constitutional authority. So, two valid points you give in for of the government. And in critical analysis, you can point it out. The recommendation is also required. So it is kind of a very balanced uh, thing and the majority judgment was that it is valid. Fine. Now, uh, some extra point uh, like here you can see the first de uh, demonetization happened back in 1946, second in 1978 and third in 2016. So three demonetization happened. 
So one more thing I need to uh, specify here is one more uh, keyword from this uh, whole judgment. If you see a five judge constitutional bench of the Supreme Court has rejected the challenge by 58 petitioners. 58 petitioners were there to challenge the validity of demonetization. But it was rejected by a five judge constitution bench. Now here the keyword is constitution bench. Now what is a constitution bench? Now what is the origin? What is the constitutional provisions of constitution bench? So here comes the quality topic. So basically this is a economic topic but, but the constitutional bench is a quality topic. First of all constitutional bench is benches of a supreme court of five or more. Number one five or more this is. Now from where come this constitutional bench concept came like from where, which article of the constitution it is article 145 clause 3. Now 145 clause 3 article says the minimum number of judges should be 5 for two kinds of things for constitutional interpretation cases interpret or interpret interpretation of fact or law. Any case where the constitution like it is required to interpret the constitution or any fact or any law. So that will be a constitutional bench will be set. Minimum number will be 5. Second is any case or any uh, thing under article 143. Now what is 143? 143 is when the president wants any opinion from the Supreme Court on matters of any kind of public interest matters related to any constitutional interpretation or fact or a law. So the opinion can be taken from the Supreme Court by the president. For that cases also constitutional bench will be set up. This is what is mentioned in article 145 3, 145 clause 3. Okay, fine. So this is the connectivity part. So as I said ki this whole uh, lecture every topic I will try to connect the interconnected topics. So this is one of that topic. So it is basically a polity uh, sorry economic topic but we connect it to, to a polity topic. So polity so economy gets connected to polity topic. Okay fine. Now coming to the next topic that is country is largest city forest is, able, is about to come in the temple city of Vrindavan country largest city forest now first of all you should know the keywords associated with this topic which is required for prelims that is more important okay you simply cannot uh, be take your pre preparation limited to this part okay, what is the place and this is the largest uh, city's largest forest no so here when we talk about city forest we have to know about the concept of urban forests so this is a environment topic okay urban forest second we need to know about city of vrindavan now when you know about city of vrindavan like for example which river flows so yamuna river flows so it becomes a geography topic plus now if you know more detailing about the historical significance of Vrindavan, you will come to know ki personalities like Vallavacharya, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they all visited there. So it means it becomes a ancient topic, ancient history. It becomes an ancient history topic. So, see the connectivity from this simple uh, current affair, you are connecting with environment, you are connecting with geography, you are connecting with ancient history. Some more related topics also associated. There is something called World Forum on Urban Forest. So, there is a forum, kind of a convention, a forum or a meeting 
for the informal meeting. So here you connected with international agreements or forum. So it becomes a IR topic. Because the point is you are talking about urban forest. So you should also know this because nowadays questions are being asked. Nagarban scheme. Now this is a domestic or our country's one scheme. So you connect it with a scheme. It's a very normal scheme about urban forest by Ministry of Environment. Now there is also another connected current affairs related to this current affair. Some days, some months back, the UP government, it was one of a kind uh, uh, initiative, Mathura Vrindavan Carbon Neutral Target of 2041. Okay. So all these topics becomes a miscellaneous topic of from a particular one current affair topic. We try to cover all this. Now coming to the concept of urban forest. Urban forest is nothing but it is a uh, managing trees, managing trees and forest in urban areas. Very simple. So it's the art, science and technology of managing trees and forest resources in and around urban community ecosystems for sociological, economical and aesthetic benefits. Nowadays what happens is now urbanization is on an increase. So here the world is fasting fast becoming an urban place and almost two-third of the world's population is expected to exist in urban areas by 2025. So that is the need of urban forestry. Also cities occupy less than 3% of the global terrestrial surface but account for 78% of carbon emissions. It's a very big amount, 78% of carbon emission, uh, it goes to the city, like the cities are responsible for it. 60% of the residential water use and 76% of the wood used for industrial purposes. So that is the reason why urban forestry becomes very crucial or important. Now one more important point you need to add it uh, from the government data. The per capita urban green space is found to be highest in Gandhi Nagar in Indian cities. So you need to mention, you need to know this because they may ask Gandhinagar has the highest per capita urban green spaces. Around 152.8 square meter. Okay. Fine. Now coming to the city of Vrindavan. So, first of all, we need to know something about Vrindavan, then we will know the historical background. See, Vrindavan is a city in Mathura district, UP. Vrindavanam is a uh, significant part of Krishna pilgrimage circuit. So, here you have to cover all those pilgrimage circuits. So, the topic becomes pilgrimage, another topic. Pilgrimage circuits. Okay. It also includes Mathura, Varsana, Gokul, Govardhan, Kurukshetra, Dwarka and Kut. Now, it is located in Braj Bhumi region and holds religious importance in Hinduism, in the Vais Vaishnavism aspect of Hinduism, as Krishna spent most of his childhood days in this city. So, here we can connect it to the Vaishnavism aspect. Yamuna river flows through this city. Now, coming to the historical significance. Now, we have to, we have to link with medieval, in particular to medieval history. and Bhakti movement. Now, it was established in 16th and 17th centuries as a result of an explicit treaty between the Muslims and the Hindu emperors and is an important Hindu pilgrimage site. So, this city was established because of a treaty between the Delhi Sultanate and the Hindu emperors and from then it became a pilgrimage site. Second point is Pallavacharya, Pallavacharya when he was 11 visited Vrindavan, he visited this particular place. Later on he performed three pilgrimages of India barefoot giving discourses on Bhagavad Gita at 84 places. These 84 places are known as Pushti Marg Baithak. So, we all know Pushti Marg school or Pushti Marg philosophy is, was propounded by Pallavacharya. Now, when the question comes, Pushti Marg Baithak is related to what? It is related to those 84 places where Pallavacharya gave speeches or discourses. 
on his philosophy okay now his philosophy was pure non dualism means shuddh advaita now all these things are a part of our medieval history now all this philosophies there is a topic of philosophies so we need to cover from there uh, like we need to connect current affairs to our static part okay fine so pushtimarg uh, philosophy is based on this non dualism and uh, he stayed in vrindavan for four months each year and vrindavan thus heavily influenced his formation of pushtimarg so when he stayed there it in a way influenced him or made him go for a uh, open or uh, propound that particular theory that is the pushti mark school or pushti mark sect okay now coming to the next thing the essence of vrindavan was lost over time until the 16th century when it was rediscovered by chaitanya mahaprabhu now chaitanya mahaprabhu is a bhakti saint of bengal now this is also a very important uh, topic because chaitanya mahaprabhu questions are already asked in mains 2018 paper in mains 2018 there was one question on chaitanya mahaprabhu so in the year 1515 chaitanya mahaprabhu visited vrindavan with the purpose of locating the lost holy places associated with krishna's life so here you need to cover from static and that too in a detailed way about ballavacharya and about chaitanya mahaprabhu because both visited vrindavan and vrindavan is in news so this is how you have to link your current affairs with static you cannot keep yourself limited to one particular current affair because since last some years upsc prelims has become very dynamic in nature they are asking very detailed questions okay fine now recently uh, we are connecting current affairs to this uh, vrindavan that is mathura vrindavan carbon neutral so this particular places has to be carbon neutral this is what up government has announced the up government has announced that mathura vrindavan is aiming to become a net zero carbon emission tourist destination by 2041 you have to remember the year 2041 so this is one of a kind one of a kind initiative when it comes to tourist destination places so this will be first such carbon neutral master plan for a tourist destination in india before this uh, nothing came for a tourist destination to be a carbon neutral there can be carbon neutral for airports but not for tourist destinations okay now there is another topic related to this that is world forum on urban forest now because we are covering urban forest so the topic is urban forest so i thought of including this also so we can have a connectivity to ir subject nowadays conventions questions are being asked now simple it is a forum forum means it's a informal event it is not a international organization so basically it is a international informal event where countries uh, uh, environmentalist private sector ngo civil societies they come they sit together they talk and they decide something like 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 a, uh, like a uh, they give some guiding principles to other countries to work on a particular objective and here it is urban forestry so it is an informal platform jointly developed by fao fao is food and agriculture organization so un also is a part here because it is under un and two other organization which you do not need to remember because these are very local level organization of another country italian society and some it may be some french or something fine so here it aims at consolidating promoting and implementing the outcomes of the first edition of the forum so you need to know when this first edition happened so the first world forum on urban forest happened in mantova italy in 2018 
तो इट वाज अ न्यूज बैक इन 2018 नाउ इन दिस ईयर 2023 इट विल बी न्यूज बिकॉज़ द सेकंड वर्ल्ड फोरम ऑन अर्बन फॉरेस्ट विल बी हेल्ड एट वाशिंगटन डीसी इन अक्टूबर 2023 नाउ द थिंग इज अर्बन फॉरेस्ट इज इन न्यूज रीसेंट जनवरी सेकंड वर्ल्ड फोरम ऑन अर्बन फॉरेस्ट विल बी इन न्यूज दैट इज इन अक्टूबर एंड आवर प्रीलिम्स इज इन जून so you try to make the connectivity this it is in you so when urban forestry you study you need to study about this also in june 20 2023 now the question comes trees trees cities program there is something called the trees cities of the world program trees cities of the world program now if you remember back in 2020 one city from india was recognized as a 2020 tree city of the world now what was that city that city is nothing but hyderabad so hyderabad was the city which was the only city from india which was recognized as the 2020 tree city of the world as per the tree cities of the world program now this tree cities of the world program it was started at which place now the thing is it was started at the first forum on urban forest now see how the connectivity happens now we started this topic from urban forestry from vrindavan now we have reached in forum on urban forest now we are reaching to another current affairs that is hyderabad which is in news now we go back to tree cities program now again we come back to first World Forum on Urban Forest. So this is the connectivity you have to do in your preparation of current affairs. Now this is not, this should not stop here. Some topics you need to do on your own, which I have mentioned here. Because if you get the topics, you can do it on your own. So because World Forum on Urban Forest is there, so you may get confused in another forum that is World Forum on Forest. That is UN in particular UN's Forum on Forest. That is different. This is different. This particularly on UN, UN has a agency of uh, to do something on UN DP uh, for development program, for environment program, uh, for uh, uh, UN, UN UN. So, so similarly, one for forest also it is there. UN Forum on Forests. Okay, basically it comes under an associated organization under UN ECOSOC. That is one of the permanent organization, Economic and Social Council. Fine. Three cities of the world program we have covered. I already explained here. Now you can also go through the global forest goals report. So, so there is a task for you. Mention in the comment box which is the organization which which publishes global forest goals. What is the organization name? You can mention in the comment box. The last is the Nagar Van scheme. The Nagar Van scheme is. Uh, india's ministry of environment scheme and it also promotes urban forestry so you can go some detailing three to four lines from this particular scheme so the topic is urban forestry so better to go topic wise you can you can just write one answer on urban forestry and you can mention uh, you can put all these notes and all these topics for self study or prelims in urban forestry okay fine now moving ahead we have another uh, current affair that is smart program now you need to know here what all things to cover first then how to cover i'll tell you now the the current affair is smart program to boost ayurved or ayurveda now when the word ayurveda comes then ayush ministry comes into play because ayush ministry um, it was created for this only ayurveda unani all those traditional medicine systems of india now smart initiative program is for ayurveda professionals to boost research and development in ayurveda in our country to boost research and development of ayurveda now if you see here the national commission for indian system of medicine and the central council for research in ayurvedic sciences these are the two prominent institutions under ministry of ayush who regulates medical education and conducts scientific research respectively 
so medical education this scientific research this scientific research done by ccras and regulates medical education this is national commission for indian system of medicine now the keywords come here two keywords one is ayurved you need to know all those information or the historical significance or with related to ancient history will connect it plus national commission for indian system of medicine now you may feel ki this is a very normal commission or you may feel ki it was not in use but it's in use because this commission is a statutory body first of all it's a statutory body it came from a law now if it came from a law then from which law the law name is national commission for india system of medicine act of 2021 last year it was in use now this is a act from where this commission came which regulates which regulates the indian system of medicine okay now it also replaced a very old act a 1970 act which we will cover in the next slide first of all we will cover ayurveda okay fine now this is ayurveda this is a basic information ayurveda is a alternative medicine system with historical roots with historical roots in the indian subcontinent it is based on the idea that disease is caused by an imbalance or a stress in a person's consciousness it is heavily practiced in india nepal around 80% of the population report using ayurveda now it embraces all living beings human and also non human it is divided into three main branches nara ayurveda satva ayurveda vriksha ayurveda these are three names um, hindi names or you can say sanskrit names the meaning nara ayurveda deals with human life satva ayurveda deals with animal life and vriksha vriksha means plants so it, it deals with plant life its growth and diseases ayurveda is not only a system of medicine but also a way of life for complete positive healthy and spiritual attainment so these are the basic information about ayurveda which uh, mostly everyone knows it but from upc point of view this slide is important now the origin now the origin of ayurveda dates back to the vedic era now vedic era ancient history most material of ayurved relating to health and disease are available in the atharva veda atharva veda again ancient history we have covered it now we are simply linking we are simply linking the current affair to our static part historians claim that ayurveda is a part of atharva veda fine however rigveda which is the earliest veda rigveda is the earliest veda it also mentions about diseases and medicinal plants fine now obviously in the vedic era uh, like these were not codified the vedic uh, text were not codified at that point of time so when the word codified comes the, the earliest codified document on ayurveda is charaka samhita this is also we study in ancient history sushruta samhita is another codified document sushruta samhita we also cover in ancient history now the most important part is chinese pilgrim fa haiyan which is a very celebrated traveler in our ancient history also we study about fa hen now the, the chinese pilgrim who came during the gupta period who came during the gupta period he also described the institutional approach of indian medicine so it again becomes a ancient history so here all these terms we have studied in our ancient history or we will study or we have studied in our ancient history so this is how you have to cover current with static you cannot simply focus on current affairs okay now these are some initiatives uh, i have mentioned here which you can go through national ayush mission aahar kranti mission ayush sanjeevani app these are all government initiatives for the development of ayurved and uh, you can also uh, go to the ministry of ayush you can also go through the ministry of ayush and see check for the year end review where you will get some uh, uh, schemes and you can go through the schemes so that uh, if any question comes from uh, in the prelims you can attend okay fine so coming to the second keyword that is national commission for 
Indian system of medicine. Now this commission, first of all this is a commission. Now if it's a commission, there has to be some members, number one. Now this commission came from where? Now it came from an act, that is this act, National Commission for Indian System of Medicine Act of 2021, which is very recent news. Which is a very recent news because in 2020 there was a bill and it was uh, like approved or it got the assent in 2021. So this act is from 2021. Now the commission is of 29 members appointed by the central government. So this commission like from the name only you know it regulates the Indian system of medicine. It regulates. Now Indian system of medicine like it regulates Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha and Sovarikpa. Now here we have covered the historical significance of Ayurveda. So there is a task for you because everything can't be covered here because we have we have to cover it in a limited time also. So you have to cover Unani, Siddha and Sovarikpa. You have to cover in a similar way the way we cover Ayurveda. At least try to cover with her ancient history or medieval history or modern history. You will come to know why I have used ancient, medieval and modern with particular to Unani, Siddhan, Swaripa. If you go through the internet sites, you will come to know. Okay. Now, some background of, about this commission. In 1971, uh, there was a council that is Central Council of Indian Medicine. It was set up under an act that is in same act, Central Council Act of 1970. Now, this council for the first time recognized post independence recognized ayurveda it recognized ayurveda now at that point of time to why this council was made to monitor higher education in indian system of medicine including all these four to monitor higher education in these four uh, systems of medicine but now it is 2021 so they needed some more uh, some better uh, kind of powers so this act was replaced by the recent act of indian system of medicine act so they will regulate all things related to this indian system of medicine any medical practitioners and etc etc now coming to the next topic that is first human space flight program gaganyaan so Gaganyan was in new since 2022 because of pandemic it was uh, it did not happen but uh, yesterday the government said it will be launched in 2024 okay so here are some points you need to know twenty twenty four now before before it gets launched there will be two preliminary launchings so the first launch will be unmanned this is the first launch Two preliminary, one will be unmanned, no man will go. Because if the Gaganyan rocket goes into space, then it should also return safely in the same way. Because after all, Gaganyan is a, it will be a manned mission. Three persons will go. If you see here, three people. So, be, so be, for safety purpose, initially, the rocket will go, the first launch will go. Okay. In the second, because there will be two preliminary. In the second, a robot will go. A robot will be there as a human replica. Now in the third, in the third experiment, humans will go. So in the third experiment, humans will go. The first, the launch will be of a rocket, second will be a robot and in the third, the humans will go into a 400 kilometer orbit for a three day mission. For a three day mission. Okay, now the whole, uh, this work, the project has been given to Human Space Flight Center that is HSFC, headquarter is in Bangalore, headquarter is in Bangalore. Now this Human Space Flight Center, it works under ISRO, now ISRO works under, there is no ministry. For ISRO, it works directly reports to, there is a department of space. Now department of space directly reports to prime minister's office. It also reports directly to prime minister's office, there is uh, no ministry. Even the DAE, that is 
department of atomic energy also reports directly to prime minister office even the raw that is the external intelligence agency it also directly reports to pmo but the internal agency that is ib intelligence bureau reports to ministry of home ministry of home affairs so ib reports to ministry of home raw reports to pmo da that is department of atomic energy reports to pmo and dos that is department of space reports to pmo and under department of space isro works under isro human space flight center the work the project has been given to this okay fine so the crew members training will also happen at the astronaut training facility which is also in bangalore so rest this information are not much in, uh, important you can just go through some extra two to three uh, points about gaganyaan it is available in the net now coming to another topic that is first eam that is external affairs minister external affairs minister level meet happened between two countries india and austria in the last 27 years now jay shankar said indian diaspora in austria the indian people who were staying in austria he said he calls india's g20 presidency very big deal and there was a normal meet it was a normal meet it was a visit to austria so no great points about this but we will cover the border countries because it will help us in map based question because europe is a very important part when it comes to mapping in upsc so here what you can do is you can cover the map from about austria so when you read about austria so one river you need to know that is danube danube river or danube river you can pronounce it in any ways so this river you have to cover number one second thing you have to you have to cover the border areas so how to cover if you see here first is switzerland is a border area slovenia is a border area hungary is a border area slovakia is a border area czech republic is a border area and germany also italy is a border area here so these are the border areas so it becomes very difficult to remember so how to remember which are not border areas so 100% if the question comes they'll try to put poland they'll try to put poland and croatia just remember poland and croatia are not borders poland and croatia are not borders rest germany switzerland germany is a big country here switzerland italy and austria is a land locked country remember it is a land locked country so there will be no connectivity direct connectivity to any sea so adriatic sea is here adriatic sea is here to italy not to austria so in the comment box what you can do is write the bordering countries which borders adriatic sea only those countries which borders adriatic sea see the internet and write it in the comment box okay now uh, one alliance happened g20 digital innovation alliance G20 Digital Innovation Alliance. So, as a part of India's G20 presidency, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has launched Stay Safe Online Campaign and G20 Digital Innovation Alliance. Now, G20 is in news. It is in news since some days because India is uh, the president now. Okay. Now, Stay Safe Online Campaign is nothing. It is by the uh, METI Ministry of uh electronics and information technology it simply said that it created an awareness to stay safe in this online world because of lot of security threat cyber security threats are happening lot of uh, data theft are happening it is uh, like that data privacy is also in news so they just wanted to create an awareness through this stay safe online campaign now what about g20 innovation alliance now g20 innovation alliance now it said it will just give a boost to the startups
it will give a boost to the startups for boosting any kind of digital technologies like uh, agriculture tech education tech anything okay so here it will be an alliance of g startups from g20 nations plus also non g20 nations but those are invited those invited non g20 nations and g20 nations it is a alliance to boost the startups of their countries in uh, increasing their digital technology in various sectors six uh, there are six critical sectors no need to remember mostly uh, agriculture education etc etc okay industrial sector but they'll use digital technologies innovation in digital technologies okay now coming to the final part that is the history part birth anniversary of mannatu padmanava pillai is on january 2nd so the topic is contributors of freedom struggle modern history so here the topics to cover is nair service society nair service society it was founded directly by him 1914 now vaikom satyagraha and guruvayur satyagraha are two satyagrahas which are very important from exam point of view in particular to prelims now vaikom satyagraha happened in 1924 and guruvayur satyagraha happened in 1931 now padmanava pillai was associated or took part it was not founded by him it, it took part in both satyagraha so we need to cover all these things in detail now because all these three are very important guru vayur satyagraha is mentioned in lot of textbooks okay fine so this is the last part we'll cover so nair society nair society leadership of padmanava pillai in travancore 1914 it is a caste based organization so at the time of formation k kelapan so k kelapan was also associated with nair society so nair basically is a community for the uh, like for the betterment of that community this society was started he was a president and padmanava was the secretary when it was started he revived padmanava pillai revived the old concept of village societies which is called the karya yogams kara yogam it becomes a very prelim stuff uh, topic they can ask you kara yogams so it is associated with nair society for some time the nair society also maintained links with justice party of madras now justice party of madras is also a modern history see the link you have to link all these things and to cover from your modern history now justice party is a part of now justice party is a part of dravidian movement it is said that this party started the dravidian movement dravidian movement is a part of modern history second it started in 1916 now you should know the founder found, founders c natesha mudliar T M Nair and Tiag Raja or Tiag Raya Chetty. So these are the members who started this Justice Party in 1916. Fine. Now coming to Guru Vayur Satyagraha. Now Guru Vayur Satyagraha was completely led by K Kelapan in 1931. He demanded the entry of untouchables inside the Guru Vayur Temple in Kerala. It was a two-day long. Uh, fast taken by K K Kelapan, but on the advice of Mahatma Gandhi, he broke his fast. So Mahatma Gandhi was also associated with Guru Vayur Temple Satyagraha. Manna to Padmanabha Pillai also participated in this particular Satyagraha. Okay. Now Vaikam Satyagraha was in 
uh, you can do it self study because it is available everywhere in uh, mostly in all books k kelapan was also a part and a lot of other personalities were also a part like gandhi ji also was uh, a part of vaikom satyagraha it was a anti brahmin movement in south india okay k kelapan there are other personalities also t k madhavan t k madhavan so at least 3 to 4 personalities were associated with vaikom satyagraha you can cover okay so that's it for today we'll meet tomorrow for our next set of current affairs thank you